Hello, everybody. My name is David Gordon. Uh, your professor, Danielle Lucchese, asked me to provide a little video about transitions and those key times for transitions for individuals with disabilities as it relates to the educational process in particular. Uh, so I'm very happy to do that. Uh, I was uh, Professor Lucchese's professor at Wagner College. I'm currently the director of the Patrick Academic Resource Center at Staten Island Academy on Staten Island, New York. Uh, I am also an individual with a learning disability. Um, I didn't really learn how to read until about fourth grade. Um, I was, you know, very intelligent. I learned really early on that if you paid attention and asked questions and looked like you cared, uh, teachers would give you a B, uh, and that was really helpful for me, and that was my strategy for many years. But obviously, at some point, uh, not being able to read caught up with me, uh, and then I had to really work at it. And it turns out I had a learning disability, specifically dyslexia and dysgraphia, uh, also an intentional disorder, um, all of which I still have to this day, but I also have and have earned a PhD from Syracuse University in special education, so uh, I'm definitely a big proponent of that. A disability doesn't have to limit you in any ways. You just have to be really thoughtful about how you approach your educational career. So to start off with, I think it's important for us to think about um, when we talk about key transition times, initially I think talking about and focusing on uh, key milestones and developmental milestones is really the way to kind of go about it. But conceptually, what I want you guys to think about for a, a couple minutes here before we dive into any specifics about developmental milestones, which if we do, we'll only do so briefly, is when we think about individuals with disabilities, I like to think about individuals' needs across different domains. Specifically, what are their needs physically? What are their needs socially? What are their needs emotionally? What are their needs cognitively or academically, and then as some of my colleagues from Sub-Saharan Africa have said, what are their needs spiritually? Um, so all five of those domains can be impacted by being an individual with a disability and by the community that you're in and the cultural background you come from uh, and how that fits into your world as a learner and in those transition times, I think is really important. So that I think is an important framework to keep in mind as we kind of move forward. So really quickly along those lines, when we talk about you know physical ways that disabilities can impact an individual, it might be in relation to mobility, it might be in relation to vision, it might be in relation to auditory and hearing, or it might be in relation to um, expressive language or receptive language. So how somebody understands what other people are saying and how somebody expresses what they're saying, whether that's expressing it visually, whether it's expressing it verbally, whether it's expressing it in some other way. So those are all things for us to kind of keep in mind. And when we think about young kids um, from birth through age five, there's a number of supports and aspects of the law that kind of help regulate that. So the big law for individuals with disabilities and for children with disabilities is called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, I'm sure Professor Chase is going to talk about this some. I'm not going to get into it that much, but this law has been around since 1990. Its uh, forerunner by a different name was originally developed in 1975. Um, but in relation to families and key transitions, there's certain aspects of this law that can be really helpful. Um, first is something called an individualized family service plan. And this allows families anywhere from the age of birth to three to go to their local school district and say, I think there's a developmental milestone that my child's not reaching and I need your assistance. And the public school system, based on this part of ID. IDEA is supposed to work with the family to help figure that out and then address it. Um, <coughs> at ages one to three, you'll often hear families talk about something called early intervention. Uh, and that's if we see something with a child where they need a physical aspect in particular of their um, development to be addressed, can be addressed. 
Um, in, in addition, once a child reaches the age of three through five, all of these plans switch over to what's called an individualized educational plan or individualized educational program, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, with any of these, like I said, at this age, they, you know, kind of birth through five, it tends to focus more on physical pieces, mobility, visual, hearing, um, you know, speech communication, speech language. Um, but it can also focus on social aspects. It can sort of focus on behavioral aspects, you know, which oftentimes is where the emotional piece comes in, as well as the academic pieces. If somebody's not reaching some of those expected academic and cognitive milestones or attentional milestones and so on. Um, just due to time, I'm not going to get into the, the individualized educational program so much, but I did provide a slide or two on that, and I'm happy to talk about that more if anybody wants. Um, but at my school, at Staten Island Academy, we really have emphasized addressing these early intervention issues. Uh, our program starts at age three, and really from age three through second grade, we're focusing a lot on occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, because one of the things we know in education and in special education is if you can address these issues earlier, it prevents larger, more complex academic cognitive issues later on. Um, you know, it doesn't prevent them, but oftentimes we can minimize things and allow students to have a better educational experience, which is always our goal. Once we hit late elementary, early middle school, we really start to focus more on the academics and the cognitive pieces. Hopefully by then, speech issues have been addressed, uh, occupational issues have been addressed or are continuing to be addressed. Um, but the academic work in really that transition time from third grade and especially in fourth grade starts to take a cognitive leap. We stop just asking kids, what happened in this story? What did the character do? And we start to ask more of the why questions. Why do you think the author did this? Why do you think this is the main idea? And why is this main idea important in this story? And for some kids, we find that is kind of a trigger point um, and a transition point where some kids can make that leap naturally and other kids developmentally aren't there yet and they need assistance in making that type of leap. Um, once we start to talk about early middle school, late, you know, through middle school grades, five, six, seven, and into grades eight. And I, it's what I call, it's, it's uh, you know, it's everybody's in the pool, everybody's in the water. It's a free swim. Um, it, there's so much social, emotional, cognitive, chemical, biological changes going on in children at that point. Anything can be happening. So you can have a sixth grader who develop, physically develop, physically hasn't developed yet, but emotionally and cognitively is ready for that next adolescent steps and relationships and so on. And then you can have other kids that have physically turned into young men and young women, but cognitively they're still functioning more like kids. They just haven't made that developmental leap that matches with their biological leap. And those are all things that we, we look at and need to consider when we talk about individualized programs for kids is we want to be looking at all of those aspects of de development, which is why I made that uh, point initially before about those four or five domains to look at. Once we hit 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grade, so late middle school, early high school, then we really are looking at um, children slash youth slash young adults' abilities to make that jump to more abstract reasoning. Uh, we ask them to inference and you know, make inferences more and things along those lines. And that's another point where transition-wise, we find kids have a difficult time making that leap. Um, so all of those things become important for us to look at. And again, that's where the individualized educational program should be functioning as a guide. Uh, one of the things that's really wonderful in our country compared to many other countries is that the individualized educational program is designed, especially from age 14 on, for the individual student with a disability to be a participant. It is always designed in this country for parents to be a participant, which is not the case in many other countries around the world. Um, I recently did some work in Mozambique and Africa, and there is no special educational system. There is no 
diagnostic system for kids to be diagnosed with disabilities. It's strictly up to a parent going to a hospital, getting a diagnosis, um, and then there's no feedback loop to the school system at all. And so that's work that we're doing in Mozambique because they're in such a different place than we are. Um, our system is far from perfect, but it does have a lot of stop gaps in it. Lastly, um, the last big transition is really that tw transition from secondary school to post-secondary school. So for individuals with disabilities, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act goes up to the age of 21 or high school graduation. So if you graduate at 18 um, and you're an individual with a disability, once you graduate, you are no longer protect protected under IDEA. Um, if you go to school until 21, which many individuals with cognitive-based disabilities may do, um, they're protected until 21, but at some point, they either graduate high school or age out at the age of 21. So once the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is no longer the protecting body, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, becomes the protecting law. Uh, and the Americans with Disabilities Act um, was also passed in 1990. Um, it's a wonderful law, but the big piece to keep in mind for individuals in the school setting is the onus of responsibility changes. So under IDEA, the public school is responsible to make sure the student gets a free appropriate public education. Once they have achieved that and they graduate high school or turn 21, then the Americans with Disabilities Act says the onus of responsibility is on the individual with a disability. So if you're an individual with a disability going to a college or university, it's up to you to disclose that you have a disability and what your needs are. It's up to you to make sure that your professors know and other people know that you have accommodations that you need. It's up to you to let the college or university know what supports and services you need to be successful. So the onus of responsibility under ADA falls on the person with a disability. Under IDEA, it falls on the school district. And that's always an important thing that we try to explain to students so they understand as they're making that transition from high school to college. Uh, one of the things that we do at Staten Island Academy, I talked about working with the younger kids. Um, we also, mostly our goal is to make sure kids go to the college or university of their choice. And that means we work a lot with 10th, 11th, and 12th graders to make sure that they're keeping everything in mind that they need to in relation to the college search process. I've provided a couple of slides on that as well. I don't want to talk about that too much. Uh, the only thing I'll say is the college search process in its basic areas, whether you're an individual with a disability or not, you should be looking at the same types of factors of what's important for you. Location, cost, geography, um, whether you want to be in a city, whether you want to be in the suburbs, whether you want to be in a rural area. Does it have a major you're interested in? And then you should also be finding out what do they provide for disability support and then what do I need? And for individuals with disabilities that have more complicated, complicated and complex medical needs, keeping that in mind as well is important. How close are you to a treating center? Like, So if you're going to go away to school and you're going to be in a school in a rural area, Where's a treating center that can meet your needs if your uh, disability involves you needing to go to hospitals at time for treatment and support? So all of those are things to kind of keep in mind. Um, hopefully this gives you a, a little taste of transition times to look at. Um, a little bit about my background and my story. And as Ms. Lucchese knows, I'm always happy to call in uh, and answer any questions you guys have or to do it electronically as well. So I wish you all a wonderful day, and hopefully I will see you around. Take care.